1915, filmmaking pioneer D.W. Griffith released The Birth of a Nation, a piece of disturbingly racist cinema that presented African Americans as animalistic monsters, which in short order became a classic of the era. That film has become the quintessential example of racism in early cinema, but six years prior to the release of that monstrosity, Griffith created an eight-minute short film in which every character was a Native American. In doing so, Griffith gave us some insight into how he and the rest of America viewed those peoples. If The Birth of a Nation reflected unnerving contemporary ideas about African Americans and the role of the KKK in American history, then this earlier short, called The Mended Loot, provides us with a valuable glimpse about how Native Americans were seen and stereotyped at this time. We should remember that when this film was made in 1909, that the Wounded Knee Massacre had occurred less than 20 years before. At the time of the Mended Loot's release, the Indians were routinely viewed as savages, but what Griffith shows us is the nuance contained within that view. In this piece, savagery existed in two distinct forms, the noble and the ignoble. One could be a noble savage, a person who lived in a state close to nature, but who was personally, perhaps even spiritually, enriched by the experience. In contrast, pure savagery, or ignoble savagery, was the model most commonly used to justify the recent and historic atrocities suffered by Native America. In The Mended Loot, Griffith helps to illuminate how white Americans viewed the Indians and the competing and often contradictory ideas that sat at the heart of that racial view. Griffith may have only set out to create a short romantic adventure, but what he provides us with in this film is an opportunity to consider the specific type of racism that was directed at Native Americans in the early 20th century. This was a study on the nature of savagery, the ignoble versus the noble savage. This is Rising Moon, played by Florence Lawrence, one of the earliest film stars. This shot of the village is Native America as escapist fantasy, a place where the texture of life feels disconnected from the world inhabited by the audience. The shot is framed to balance teepees with the surrounding woodlands to emphasise the importance of the surrounding wilderness. It reminds the audience of Griffith's view of this people, of their perceived relationship to the natural world. Here, Rising Moon's father, the chief glimpsed earlier, rejects her choice of husband in favour of Standing Rock, whose representatives appear to be purchasing favour with a stock of coats. Fantasy marred, this scene has devolved into an auction, with Rising Moon going to the highest bidder. The fantasy of the outdoors is thrown into sharp relief by Griffith's stereotypes, an idyllic life marred by the slave-like sale of one's daughter for coats. Standing Rock and his cohorts mock Little Bear. They laugh in his face to contrast the nobility of the few with the ignobility of the many. We're now beginning to get a strong sense about what the racial substructure of this film is. The Indians can be noble, Griffith concedes, but, he argues, they tend not to be. Welcome to the American West in 1909. The physicality of Little Bear in the scene is almost messianic. It speaks to the audience of spirituality on the one hand, while sending a clear signal about the intentions and righteousness on the other. This is yet another vision of Griffith's noble savage. Consider the body language of this character's rival, seen in the preceding scene. He hunches over Rising Moon, his shoulders arching so that he wraps himself about her, blocking her path to escape. Here, Rising Moon exits her prison, though apparently she has so much to fear that she almost re-enters it. If the last scene with Little Bear reflected the idea of the noble savage, this scene with Standing Rock accomplishes the opposite. This is a Native American depicted as an unqualified savage, a man overcome by his own lust and willingness to resort to violence. 
As we briefly cut back to Rising Moon, Griffith contrasts his opposing views of the Indians, the noble with the ignoble. The body language of Little Bear once again contrasts with that of his rival. His back is rod straight, his gestures are large and classical, and he envelops his love in a close embrace, the type of which we can hardly imagine Standing Rock mimicking. Important gestures in silent film. Again, we contrast Little Bear's nobility to Standing Rock's ignobility. Backs are bent, faces aimed towards the ground in an almost animalistic display, whilst the close, pack-like nature of the Indians help to reinforce that condescending, naturalistic idea. Of course, the audience can't forget what it is that Standing Rock is seeking for. He's on no love quest, and surely cannot expect mutual affection, or perhaps even consent, from his new wife. The animal versus the noble, Standing Rock versus Little Bear. These two contrasting figures speak of the extremes that often dictated Native American stereotypes in popular culture. The canoe chase is the action centrepiece of this film. The action here is frantic, with a loaded kinetic energy that strips it of any seeming forethought. Standing Rock and his compatriots act almost instinctively, the murder of Little Bear's accomplice becoming yet another example of the antagonist's ignoble nature, whilst the speed with which they move on, seemingly untroubled by the act, suggests a complete lack of personal impact, perhaps a lack of conscience even. As Standing Rock's canoe comes into shot, we see the balance between nobility and ignobility, as Griffith saw it, laid bare on the screen. A young couple in love are making their escape, but they are pursued, it seems, by a much greater number. The balance of power is by far weighted in Standing Rock's favour. The shot of canoe after canoe reinforces the point. Wave after wave after wave of enemy canoes loaded with racial ideas glide past the camera. The water gets visibly choppier, suggesting increased danger. And then? Nothing. Fade to black. End of narrative. No resolution. Did Little Bear and Rising Moon make their escape? Perhaps the audience will ask itself that question. Or perhaps they will ask themselves what might have happened if they were captured. Would Little Bear have been put to death? And what of Rising Moon being made to marry Standing Rock? By failing to provide a narrative resolution to this film, Griffith instead invites the audience to make their own, whilst hinting at the futility of such an effort. In the world he crafted in these eight short minutes, Griffith has already shown that in his view, the balance between savagery and noble savagery is weighted heavily in favour of the former. So what if Little Bear and Rising Moon escaped? It makes no odds because the world Griffith had constructed would continue to be a place in the wilderness where true nobility was a rare trait, it existed surrounded by its polar opposite. This was the image of Native America that Griffith helped to cultivate, and this is the image that this movie helped to reinforce. Thanks for watching this special presentation by the American Studies and History podcast. For more, please visit my website at www.darrenreed.com history.co.uk or follow me on Twitter at that historian. Thanks for watching.